You may not be among the millions of people who tuned into ABC for eight consecutive nights in 1977 to watch the groundbreaking Roots miniseries. But whether you know it or not, your understanding of what slavery looks, sounds, and feels like has no doubt been influenced by the show that shocked and fascinated the nation when it aired. Ask anyone who's seen it, and they'll readily recall its most quotable line. Behold, the only thing greater than yourself. And of course, one of Root's most memorable moments. I want to hear you say your name. Your name is Toby. What's your name? Gunter. Nearly four decades and multiple on-screen depictions of slavery later, Roots continues to be the definitive dramatic account of slavery in America. Until now, the new film, 12 Years a Slave, sets a new bar for filmic depictions of slavery with a portrayal that is so memorable because it is simply impossible to forget. Joining me now is Laura Murphy, who's professor at Loyola University in New Orleans and author of Metaphor and the Slave Trade in West African Literature. Salome Shatilit, professor at the University of Pennsylvania and author of Sites of Slavery. Khalil Muhammad of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture and managing editor of the Griot.com, Joy Reid. I want to start with you, Khalil, because if you had to just sort of say, what are the, the aspects of slavery that Americans think we know that we're actually getting wrong? Four words, Lincoln freed the slaves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's part of it. <laughs> well, it, but it's not ironic in this moment. Mm -hmm. it, it really is the baseline from which we start, which is mm -hmm. that slavery is an aberration. Slavery mm -hmm. happened. There are no villains. It's this amorphous space that just landed in America. Even the voice of 19th century uh, mm -hmm. social experts and commentators at the time blamed slavery on generations before. They had mm -hmm. cursed the nation with the stain of this institution and the presence of Africans in America. Mm -hmm. So we really are not too much further today from that moment. And the power of this narrative of progress mm -hmm. leaves us with this sense that slavery happened, but it ended. Yep. Racism in the segregation yes. period happened, but it ended. Yep. And it's the but it ended, just like slavery freed the slaves, yeah. that sets the framework for our understanding. And 12 years of slave gives us no framework for that. Yeah, Galil, I have to say, the movie is extremely painful. But probably the most stunning part for me was that it was shot in New Orleans. And there are moments in the film that are blocks from my house. There are extras in the film who I know from town. And so you don't have that sense that it ended in part because it's, it's happening, right, like it's literally happening blocks from my house. And I, I, it made me, I walked out and in fact my, my husband who I'd seen it with said, you know, there was a point at which he'd been arrested for parking tickets and was put in a cell for three days and sort of forgotten along with three other men and that he'd felt that same sense of at any point who you are, your free papers, your, it, it could just be gone. I can't even really talk about this movie. But Salome, I just, I wonder about that notion that sites of slavery are the things that we are living in right now, that we are still informed by the experience of slavery. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I was really interested in my book is that we have this, like, historical amnesia about slavery, right? Like, it's an aberration as opposed to fundamental to American democracy. But that mm -hmm. those who've been the custodians of American democracy, in my mind, are African Americans who have kept this story of slavery alive, not only by linking it to contemporary race relations or racial inequality, but understanding that this this early trauma has set the stage for devastating and long-term effects that lead to the present but that have never been resolved in their moment. And mm -hmm. so for me, um, sites of slavery really means the kind of ongoing way in which this early trauma, the founding trauma of America, gets re-articulated and recirculated and reinvigorated with each generation um, and also with each different social movements kind of address it, but with that it's never fully changed mm -hmm. because we actually have never changed the hierarchy of race in America. When, when you say the extent to which the descendants of slaves are actually the caretakers of American democracy, I kept, the film made me so angry. And I kept thinking, A, I haven't been angry enough lately. And this <laughs> sort of put me back in touch with that level of anger. But I also kept thinking, and then these people ran for office. Like, 
we, we were just talking about Cory Booker and PBS Pinchback and the people who, who ran for, and I thought, how do you live through the violence that this was? And then your response in the moments after emancipation mm -hmm. is to in fact engage the American Democratic Project by, I mean, like, how did we not burn the whole damn thing down? No, it's, it's, it's the hardest movie I've ever watched, but first of all, I, you know, I barely made it through Amistad, so this was torture. Like, I yes. was sitting through the thing thinking, I have to get up and leave. I saw it by myself because I didn't want to have to talk about it mm -hmm. afterwards. So I said, I'm going to go in here by myself. I'm just going to watch it and then process it on my own. And I was so angry on the way home. I was like, please don't let anybody come and talk to me yeah. right now because I was so angry, the same as you. But what's interesting is there's that phrase, the banality of evil, mm -hmm. right? But we, in terms of the way we discuss and deal with slavery in this country, we get only the banality but not the evil mm -hmm. this film made you confront the evil the entire time you started thinking to yourself was there a single decent person <laughs> in the south during this period and remember it was more than just the south and then after putting these human beings through this degrading evil for hundreds of years there then followed a hundred years of terrorism yes. against the same people yeah. how African Americans in the film one of the hardest things for me was when the group of African Americans were singing a hymn mm -hmm. and I'm thinking to myself how do you even believe in God, let alone worship and yep. praise God in the midst of this yep. horror. Yep. And to, to understand that this is the history we're not getting taught. There's this the blase notion of slavery that it was just, you know, it was it was work. Yep. You know? yep. No, yep. it was evil. Yeah, I want I want to I want to play just one. It's it's hard to play clips from the film because there aren't many you can show on television. <laughs> but one that, that really goes to this core notion of like the smallest thing being a space where there could be evil and violence. And, and, and I want to see one of the, the women who was enslaved just wanting soap. Mm -hmm. I got this from Mrs. Shaw. Mrs. Epps won't even grab me no soap to clean with. I stink so much I make myself gag. 500 pounds of cotton day in, day out. More than any man here. And for that, I will be clean. That's all I ask. And of course, the violence that is visited on her body in the moments after that is, is probably the hardest scene to watch in the film. Laura, I think part of why I felt so angry is because this is an actual slave narrative. And I kept thinking to myself, how is this the first time that a film has been made from the story of a person who actually lived it? How did it take us this long to do this? Yeah, it's a real... Um it's, it's a real mystery to me. I think the, the thing that this film captures the best is that sense of radical alienation mm -hmm. that um, Solomon Northup and all the other people he's surrounded by are uh, haunted by. They're separate. They're, mm -hmm. not make, they're not making connections with one another. They're eating alone. And I think that um, this is something that the slave narrative can capture, that sort of bare bones um, banality sometimes of mm -hmm. the life of a repeated day to day, every day, in and out, doing the same mm -hmm. thing, the same kind of horrific work. And so the slave narrative often doesn't go into in the kind of emotive detail mm. that we expect, the, the brutality, the bloodshed, mm. the horror. There's a distance in most slave narratives. Solomon Northup's is much more descriptive mm -hmm. than a lot in, in, in a sort of a Kind bloody, of intellectual, yeah, yeah. Well, in part because he was free first, right? And he, he's outraged and horrified by what he sees. He hasn't seen it since he was a child. Mm -hmm. And so the slave narrative in a lot of ways isn't so conducive mm -hmm. to uh, cinematography right. because it's not mm -hmm. as explicit as we expect. I, I want to come back on exactly that question of like being free first and the way in which that creates a, 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 a particular sort of space within this film and how it asks us to remember that everybody was free first when we come back. Mm -hmm.